Russia is the worst. They win the, the prize. Now, if you're sitting in the back, you can probably not even see the little pinnacle on top of this pyramid. What that indicates is the proportion of people who are actually receiving any treatment. And that number we know too. That's about two, two and a half million people. That's right. About one tenth of the people that meet diagnostic criteria. And there's no illness where we have a lower, what they call, penetration rate um, than addiction, okay? More importantly, if there are those here who have been to treatment programs or run treatment programs or, or whatever, uh, and they say, I, I've seen a lot about addiction, I know about addiction, yeah, me too. I've looked at all kinds of people that are up there in that pinnacle. Well, here's the point. We don't know about harmful substance use disorders because the people in that pinnacle are in no way representative of the larger population of people with problems. They are the most severe, they're the most chronic, usually forced into care. We need policies that hit that whole region there. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about, okay? Try to keep this in mind. Because as I, I, I guess when you walked in the door, you said, addiction, oh yeah, those are the guys that are panhandling all the time, asking you for money, these are the guys that are in crack houses and all that. Yeah, those are the guys way up in the pinnacle. But these guys down here, these are the guys that are always asking your sister out. These are the guys that are driving drunk. These are the guys that are vomiting on your uh, hallway uh, in your dorms. These are the uh, people who are too stoned to give you good service um, when you go to uh, McDonald's, okay? Um, and we need policies for those people too, okay? All right, let's go. We have five priorities. And oh, by the way, these slides are all available. I copied them onto this computer here. If you, you, you just give me an email and uh, uh, you can get them or get them right off of here. So I'm gonna go through every one of these. But they are all what we call demand reduction priorities. Uh, procedures and practices designed to reduce what the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, called uh, in America's insatiable demand for drugs. Okay. Well, let's talk about how we selected these. Did we just pick the word? Did I just gin them up one day? No. Um, in a very real sense, you picked these, because we went around the country talking to students, talking to faculty, talking to patients, talking to people who provide services all over the, the country. And um, frankly, it wasn't hard to come up with priorities that everybody agreed were big, serious problems. But that wasn't enough. We wanted priorities where we might actually spend your money, because never forget that, we're spending your money. We might be able to spend it in a wise way where the evidence had shown that we might have some reasonable way of, of, of making a difference. So we pick things where the evidence looked good. Big emphasis on communities. Why? Well, as you will hear, much of the evidence talks about the importance of community. Um, but there's a political reason as well. well. Let's take where I live. I live in the Bella Vista section of Philadelphia. And frankly, we couldn't care less about the people in West Philadelphia or North Philadelphia we do care about the people in Bella Vista. That's where our kids are going to school. That's where the fire department is. That's our local cops. So we felt it was politically sellable, and it was a reasonable use of the government. If the government could come up with evidence-based practices, if the government could come up with the science that would educate communities and basically equip them to take responsibility, we thought that was a reasonable use of government funds, okay? And finally, we don't need no more stinking programs. Programs are what the government's really good at. Some congressman gets an idea, well, you know, the reason I didn't use drugs is because I was able to play on the playgrounds. Yeah, that's right, let's put playgrounds everywhere. And, and in fact, that's what happens, they do playgrounds. And, and they'll do this for just as long as the money's there, and then the money goes away, and so do the playgrounds. And so we wanted things where there might be a business case for an infrastructure that would sustain in a community. 
Okay? So, you can tell me whether you think we, we hit the mark or not. Now, let's start talking about the five issues. And it's, it's, a, it's a pretty reasonable story. It goes prevention, intervention, treatment, special population, and, and data. Okay? All right, prevention. Now, we're in very good shape because over the last decade, the prevention science has been very, very clear. First thing is that there is an at-risk period for every addiction. Yep, I mean cigarettes. Yep, I mean Oxycontin, Vicodin. Yep, I also mean cocaine and all the rest of them. And that at-risk period is called adolescence. If you do not pick up a cigarette problem, alcohol problem, cocaine problem, methamphetamine problem, by the time you are approximately 21 years of age, your chances of, of uh, you know, ever getting one are really very, very small. And yes, it's true in this country, and yes, it's true in most other European countries. That's the only places where it's been studied. Now think about it in terms of another illness. Suppose I said, look, we now know that if we did just the right things throughout the period of adolescence with young women, they would not get breast cancer. Hmm. You think this country would do all it took to, to assure that? I, I think they would. Well, that is pretty close to what it is for addiction. And now I know you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, I've been to addiction programs. My God, those people are about 38 years old. Yeah, that's right. They got the symptoms, they expressed the symptoms while they were in adolescence. Usually 10 to 15 to 20 years later before you get treatment. And all the while, you're causing harms to yourself, your family, and your society. Okay. So, let's focus. If you're going to build, that's what I'm trying to tell you, is trying to give you a rationale for how to build a, a prevention strategy. It don't take no brains to say, we, we could use more and better prevention. Right. How? Let's start with adolescents. Let's not try to do prevention in 55-year-old guys, okay? All right. Here's another nice piece of news that science tells us. There's lots of risks to kids uh, during that period of adolescence. Teenage pregnancy, dropping out of school, <coughs> bullying, depression, delinquency, etc., etc., and of course drugs. The good news is that a lot of the antecedents or predictive factors are quite generic. The things that predict any one of those disorders, and I mean genetic, I mean parental, I mean environmental, I mean behavioral, those factors are pretty generic. They predict every one of them. Even better, turns out that uh, interventions that are effective in reducing the risks for any one of those, depression, teenage pregnancy, school dropout, whatever, are likely to reduce the likelihood of all of those. Hmm. So, Tom, that suggests then that instead of having methamphetamine prevention programs for 13-year-old girls, we should have generic prevention pro programs. Right, that is what it says. That ain't what we got. What we have are nine federal agencies purchasing 164 different prevention programs. Most are uncoordinated, I'll show you in a minute. Finally, and this is sort of a duh, but if you combine evidence-based interventions that affect a couple of sectors that are likely to influence a kid, um, you get more than one plus one equals two. You can often get a uh, one plus one equals three or even four effect. Now, think about that if somebody said to you, quick, I need a prevention policy right away. Oh, and by the way, it has to get through Congress, too. Here's what prevention looks like in, where are we, Greenbelt? No, we're not in Greenbelt. What's the name of this? Catonsville. Catonsville, Maryland. Right here today, this is pretty near what you got in Catonsville, Maryland, or Abilene, Texas, or uh, any place else. Notice along the top here, I have the age that roughly corresponds to adolescence, okay? And along the left column, I have sectors within a community that have some influence on kids, the schools, the parents, law enforcement, and environmental policies. Okay. Yeah, I don't quite get your point. Well, look at it. They got 
whatever is going on, they got something in the schools, probably the, the drugs are bad lecture that occurs in uh, eighth grade in the part of the health class. And down here, you got the law enforcement has something, maybe some kind of threat analysis software. What you ain't got is anything that spans the period of, at, of at being at risk, and you don't have the various sectors working together. What do you got in mind, Tom? How about this? That's what we have in mind. Get out of your way. Notice along the top now, in this segment, you have hopefully age-appropriate school interventions, perhaps part of not just the health curriculum, but other things, any place that it's pertinent. Remember, we're not just talking about drugs anymore. We're talking about gene generic uh, prevention of risks to kids. Parents have learned evidence-based skills, how to parent, how to monitor, how to enforce, okay? Law enforcement is working and quite purposely overlapped with um, the, the other sectors. And, and there are environmental policies now in Catonsville. Like what? Well, how about reducing alcohol density of, of outlets? How about no uh, cigarettes in vending machines? How about curfews for certain age kids? These are the kinds of environmental policies that have been very, very effective. Anyway, we call this a prevention prepared community because that's what they are. If they got, if you got your community aligned so that it first did a systematic analysis of the threats that were actually occurring to the kids, if those groups came together and said, I will help, I will do my part, I will work with the rest of you, um, you'd have the makings of, and of course if you used evidence-based practices, things that were shown to have worked, you'd have the makings of a very decent um, generic prevention. The other thing you'd have is a damn good business investment. And as a Fed, that's where we want to spend our money. We don't want to spend our money anymore on this stuff. And that's how it's being spent. There's a charismatic oh, preacher or a really terrific principal, and they get a, a grant. And God bless them and all of that, but it's not enough. It's nothing close to what's necessary. What we want is something that is a, a effective dose, duration, intensity of services that likely do the, do the effects. And so, while we are going to, in the President's 2011 budget, starting October 2010, we have money to create prevention-prepared communities, number one. And number two, we have said to the largest uh, federal agencies doing prevention stuff, hey, how about not working separately? How about coming together, giving a single RFP, request for proposals, a single set of performance measures, a single, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, evaluation? It's a much smarter way to do business. You're going to get much more bang for your buck. If I'm education, and I put a dollar into this community, not only am I going to get more money, more bang for my buck because they're prepared, I got Justice Department and Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration also putting a dollar in there. So my one dollar now bought me three dollars, okay? That's our prevention strategy. Uh, happy to take questions, but keep going. All right, you can't always prevent. Um, that's the case for almost every other illness, okay? But you can catch the conditions early. When, when a problem starts to emerge, you don't have to wait 18 years for that problem to fester, for the individual and the society to, to uh, feel the effects. You could intervene early. Not only that, it's, uh, that's what the science shows. Uh, Dr. DiClemente here is one of the world's experts on this. And um, in fact, uh, it's possible to detect you know, harmful substance use. Now remember where we are. We're in the middle of that pyramid, okay? We're not up there at the top. We're down at the, in the middle. It's easily done for alcohol. It's also possible to do for other substances of abuse. Now, if you're in the healthcare setting, if, I, if we go to uh, the railroad station in um, Baltimore here, 
Uh, and I say, go find you, find me some substance abusers. Your chances of finding one are basically one in ten. Little, little bit, one in seven if it's men, little one in twelve if it's, if it's uh, women. But that's what it is. Now, if you go to any healthcare setting, a primary care doctor's office, it's uh, you got a 20% likelihood. If you go to the ER or a trauma center, especially if you go at night, you could be 50, 60, 70% of all the people there have substance use disorder. And still, nobody does it. Well, why? Why don't they do it? For God's sake, it's like fishing in a stocked pond. Why? And it's easy, right? Here's why. Uh, this directly from the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, one of the world's authorities. She is an MD, PhD. And she says, there are only two things I never learned in medical school. One, substance use. Two, how to treat chronic pain. Okay, The biggest diagnoses in the country. Now, doctors haven't been taught this. Neither have nurses, pharmacists, to some extent. It's been segregated. It is the last bastion of segregation that we have in this country. Mental health and substance use disorders have grown up quite apart. And in my whole lifetime, I have never seen separate and equal, or not. Okay? So doctors are saying, why should I look for this stuff? I mean, what the hell am I going to do if I find it? And, and who, where's the treatment? I, there's no treatment in the hospital here. I guess Shady Acres or something is out there someplace, but they're not on my electronic health record. So if you want to translate science into policy, you can't just put your hands on your hips and say, well, you know, we're a disease too, and you know, there's easy, uh, Carlo Di Clemente showed that it's easy to do, you should do it, wag your finger in front of their faces. No deal. That's not going to sell nothing. You need to give them a reason to do it. You got to make it in their interests to do it. Yeah, how are you going to do that? Well, one, let's let them realize that there's something in it to find harmful substance use um, beyond um, the, the, the looking for a condition that you don't know how to treat. And there's plenty of reasons. So for example, we commissioned 38 different systematic literature reviews of how substance use, even subdiagnostic levels of substance use, complicate the diagnosis course, management, outcomes, and costs of many healthcare disorders. For example, if, you had your, if you're a doctor and uh, Carlo walks in the door and I slap a blood pressure cuff on around his neck, no, 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 no that's the doctor, not his wife, that's right. Uh, we, and we get, a, we get a blood pressure cuff on and it's, it's elevated. And I say, hmm, Carlo? I could ask you to reduce, eliminate salt from your diet. I want to get the blood pressure down, right? So you could either eliminate all salt, no more Kentucky Fried Chicken, no more anything with salt, or keep your drinking to two drinks or fewer per day. Which do you think gives you less, uh, more reduction of blood pressure? That's right, but doctors don't know this. Simply reducing, I didn't say abstinence, simply reducing your alcohol content to, to, to two drinks a day. So it's that kind of stuff that, that now docs are going, huh, maybe what, that's why Mrs. Jones, I can't get her blood pressure stable. Now, you know, maybe I will ask about that. But wait, there's more. Alcohol and dr other drug use interacts with virtually any other medication that a doctor is likely to prescribe. It. Um, today, the second highest cause of accidental death in this country, and by the way, it occurs in your age group, is prescription opiate overdose. Second only to driving car accidents as a major cause of accidental death. Doctors don't ask about other substance use when they prescribe this, okay? And finally, um, there's money. Turns out that you're wearing a white coat, you're a nurse, a pharmacist, a psychologist, a doctor, and you do five to ten minutes of education and motivational um, interviewing, as uh, Dr. DiClemente has uh, worked on for a very, very long time, 
you can not only reduce their substance use, you can save yourself and your health care organization a hell of a lot of money. Here in the state of Washington, for example, they did a fairly aggressive, not fully aggressive, but pretty aggressive uh, screening brief intervention initiative in their state, and they saved $8 million in one year. That's, that's pretty good. Okay, great. That tells you why they should do it, and that's a good reason. Provide an incentive. Another thing that will change behaviors is if you make it easier and much more tangibly worthwhile. So, in the 2011 budget, we have reduced the paperwork, increased the number of people eligible to do screening brief intervention, and increased the payment. And we think that's going to make a difference. Okay? So that's, that's uh, prevention, and that's intervention. All right. Now, not everybody. Now, we're moving up that pyramid, right? Now we're up there in diagnosis land. So if you can't intervene early, you can still do treatments. What? There aren't any treatments for addiction. Come on, my uncle was in substance abuse treatment. He went in and he came out, he relapsed right away, right? Yeah. Well, why, why is that? Do we have anything that works? And the answer is, yeah, as a matter of fact, we got that. The science has given us very effective kinds of interventions and therapies, okay? And what do I mean by effective? I mean the same level of evidence that you would ask of any medication or medical device that would be approved uh, in this country. Food and Drug Administration requires two randomized controlled trials, large-scale randomized controlled trials showing the new thing, the new drug, the new medical interventions better than placebo or better than standard. Every one of the therapies here, and, and others as a matter of fact, have that level of evidence. But wait, there's more. Every one of them is free. You already paid for them. Every one of them has instructional manuals. In fact, you can even get grants that, that will help you learn how to do it. And almost none of them are being implemented anywhere. What? What's the matter? Hold that question. But you say this is a medi uh, uh, an illness, Tom. Do you have any medications for this illness? Yep, we got that. Best uh, example is coarse cigarettes. Um, nicotine replacement therapy is quite effective. The new one, Chantrix, is uh, varenicline. That's the generic name. And they're FDA approved. If you've got alcohol or opiate dependence, you're in luck. We've got very good medications that are available to use. I have them in green here. Uh, they have FDA level evidence and they're available for use um, at your doctors, not all of them. And, and there's another one, Topiramax too. Uh, Topamax is, is there. Uh, and if you have any kinds of questions about it, we can, we can hold those till later. But the, the point is, you know, doctors could prescribe. They don't. You're not going to get those. If you go to Shady Acres Treatment Program, you're not going to get them. Well, what about other um, kinds of drug problems. What about cocaine? Yep. Some of the, uh, we got uh, medications that are effective uh, for cocaine. Um, and I have outlined here a vaccine. What do you mean vaccine? You mean you would give that to a 10-year-old kid to prevent him from ever? No. This is if you were having a cocaine problem. You can't get off crack. You can't stop the cravings. Um, not yet. Not yet. But very soon, they're, they've already shown it in three trials with humans, protects you for 90 days and really could be six months, and you simply will not feel the effects of, of cocaine. Very exciting stuff. We do not yet have anything for methamphetamine. No medication, anyway. We have all those behavioral therapies. But again, I say, the thing these have all in common is they're not being used. Why? Why in the world would you bother to pay? Because you paid for these. These are all federally developed uh, products. Remember I was talking about segregation? Here's why. This is the only area of medicine left where you have specialty care, but no meaningful involvement of primary care. The addiction treatment system developed in the 1970s with the return of Vietnam-era opiate addicts. 
Uh, finally, America said, look, I know drugs are a crime and all that, but Jesus, these are our guys. We've got to do something. And they developed a separate system with separate funding and a whole separate um, administration. And today, there are about 12,000 of them. By contrast, there's about 9,000 Starbucks, okay? There's about 100,000 um, uh, McDonald's. Most of them are very small. In fact, almost a third don't even treat 200 patients in a year. They're mom and pop shops. About two-fifths don't have a doctor. Relevance, you ask? Remember those medications I put up? You're not going to prescribe them if you don't have a doctor. About three-quarters don't have a trained psychologist or a trained psychiatric nurse or a trained psychiatric social worker someone who's had the kind of background that will enable you to do those complex behave, but effective behavioral therapies that I put up on the, on the slide. Oh, so we've got the stuff, but we don't have the infrastructure. Yep, that's right. In fact, the major professional group in every treatment program is the counselors, and they are a professional group. They're dedicated, they're a lot more dedicated to what they do than probably you are to what you do. They work very hard, and it's a shitty job. They make very bad wages, and mothers do not raise their kids to grow up to become drug and alcohol uh, counselors. I take no particular pleasure in saying it, simply the truth. In fact, um, the, this accounts for why there is, as Carlos said earlier, a 50 to 60 percent turnover rate of uh, counselors. They don't make a decent wage. They don't get the support they need. Their, their little treatment organizations are in constant financial jeopardy. Turnover rates here are about the same as the turnover rates in the fast food industry or among people who make good beds in hotels. Again, how are you going to give long-term care to somebody who's turning over? Yeah, that's terrible, but I don't really see what that has to do with your policies, Tom. Yes, you do. Think about it. If I'm sitting here and I got I want to make that little, remember that little tiny uh, pinnacle on the triangle on, on the pyramid. I want to make that bigger. One thing I could do is um, double the block grant. That's what pays for the specialty care treatment system. It's a separate funding agency. It's controlled by a separate group of people, state directors. I could do that. We chose not to do that. Why? First of all, as you could see by that pyramid. There's a whole hell of a lot of people there who need treatment, and they're not getting what's, what's there, partly because there's not enough of it, but partly because they don't want it, okay? It's segregated. Why not spend some money and put treatment where the rest of treatment occurs? Well, isn't it about time to integrate substance use services into the rest of healthcare? Why couldn't you get substance use care where you get diabetes care, where your leg is broken? Wouldn't that reduce some of the stigma? Wouldn't that improve some of the access? We think so. And so in the president's 2011 budget, we've put money into two uh, federal health care systems, very large ones. First, federally qualified health centers. There are 7,000 federally qualified health centers. And they treat 27 million people today. And by the estimate of the, uh, the agency that runs it, 50% of the people currently receiving treatment need substance use services, but are not getting it. So that's where we're putting our money. The other federal agency is the Indian Health Service, because the problems in, in uh, reservations is truly, um, um, it, it, it's terrible. I've been to these reservations, and it is just, um, it's like Holocaust. Anyway, that's what we're doing with your money to try to increase the access to, the quality of, the integration of treatment. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, a lot of people don't realize, and a lot, it turns out a lot of these people are congressmen, don't realize you can get better from substance use. That's called recovery. What exactly is recovery, anyway? Is that when you're, like, trying to get sober? No, it's not. Uh, that's what recovery is. 
This is at least one definition widely used. It's the Betty Ford Institute uh, definition. There are others. But it captures that it's not merely uh, sobriety. It's also good health and good citizenship. That's the guy you want your sister to date, not uh, the other guys, OK? Um, and the other thing is, it is possible and indeed expectable. Most people don't realize that there are about 20 million people at any given day who are in stable recovery. They have stayed away from alcohol and drugs for at least a year. They're leading good lives. And the reason people don't know it is because they look just like you. They don't look like the guy on the corner um, with the disheveled clothes and a bag of 70 cent sherry. This, they look like you and I, okay? So we are starting an office of recovery. And one of the things we're going to do with that is try to reduce some of the onerous laws that were originally developed by people, uh, by the Congress really, trying to prevent substance use, but instead have had this uh, perverse uh, quality of punishing people who are getting in, into recovery. What are you talking about, Tom? Well, this. If you decide to go out, you, you look like the kind of person who will go out tomorrow and commit a burglary. Okay. <laughs> It's a good, that's a good choice, because once you pay your um, due to society, you're going to serve your time, you will get out, you will be able to get a student loan to attend this university, you will be able to get federal housing, you will be able, uh, your kids will be able to have uh, welfare benefits. Now, if you make the mistake of having that be a drug-related burglary, you're not getting any of that stuff. You're never getting a license, you're never getting a student loan, you're never it's the gift that keeps on giving. So it is truly prejudicial. So that's one of the things, one of the many things we're going to try to do with the recovery office. All right, we're almost through, guys. There's one special population that we want to uh, pay special attention to, and it's people with drug-related offenses in the community. And here's why. First of all, you can intervene at lots of different places along this continuum. You can intervene even before you're arrested. You can intervene with people be before the trial comes up or at prosecution or at sentencing. The best examples are like drug courts, where in case you don't know what a drug court is, which again, another probably did commit a cocaine-related, uh, just I can tell from looking at it, <laughs> cocaine-related burglary, and if she arrested you and bring you before me, the, the, the judge, um, we give you a deal. We say, now look, uh, you can take your chances, go to trial, and maybe you get off, maybe you don't. But have I got a deal for you? If you go to Carlo's treatment program and you complete one year of supervised abstinence, we expunge the charge. You can truly say you haven't been arrested for a cocaine-related burden. It's a good deal, and it works. It works because instead of massive, onerous, but infrequent and uh, poorly applied punishments, this is behavior 101, guys, instead of that, you have swift, certain, but modest sanctions. Don't understand what I'm talking about, okay? If you have kids, and I don't know, uh, Johnny is playing his video game instead of doing his homework, you could say, Johnny, if you don't stop that video game, there's about a 60% chance that sometime in the next two years, I'm going to ground you for the rest of your life. <laughs> that is a reasonable approximation of what the penal system is. Okay? Or you could say, Johnny, if you don't stop right now, I turn the TV off and you're in your room for the rest of the night. You're not going to the movies tonight, and it's for sure. Which do you think will change behaviors? Right. Well, that's what have they been learning in the criminal justice system. The other thing they've been learning is to combine, that it's not love them or jail them, it's both. You can give services, you can provide good sanctions in the community, save the onerous costs of jail, plus lots of other things. And there are places like uh, San Diego, California. They had a re uh, reentry. There are 700,000 people coming out of jails and prisons every year very safe bet that half of those, 350, are alcohol and drug related. 
in San Diego, 74% of those people who were released were back, re-addicted, re-arrested, re-incarcerated, read $34,000 a year, within a year. Bad business. They instituted s sensible sanctioning, sensible uh, treatment, and, and a combination of situation, and it went to 14%. Now, I am a trained behavioral scientist, so I can tell you that 14 is a lot less than 74, okay? It is, in fact, enough to fund the school system, the primary school system in San Diego, and that's what they did. Now, why do I keep raising money? I'm just a mercenary kind of guy. Uh-uh. I'm a sales guy, and that's what's sells policy to the Congress of the United States and to you, voters. You want to see that your money is going to have some effect, and that's what we intend to do. Last thing is, is not very sexy, but it's quite necessary. If you think about it, almost everything I talked about was um, involving management of people. We, we ain't got no cures for addiction, but we ain't got no cures for hypertension, or diabetes, or tooth decay, or all kinds of things, but you can manage them. In order to manage them, you need data. And the data systems that we have are these, you've taken them when you were in high school, you probably, if you, you might have gotten exposed to them in you know, uh, household surveys. They're very large, they're very cumbersome, they may be slow, but at least they're expensive. And they don't give you management information. It's too late, too little, okay? What communities need to know is whether there's a new <laughs> drug on the horizon or a new drug-related problem on the horizon. They need to know it right away. They, they can't afford to see epidemics of like Oxycontin use throughout this country or methamphetamine in the West. Um, we need to know earlier. And they need to know whether the things they've been putting into practice are making any difference. And that's the uh, systems. So, here, is the, here are the priority areas, and these are the dollar amounts that we'll, uh, the president has asked for in the 2011 budget. Totals up to not very much money, candidly, $150 million. Sounds like a lot to me, you say. Yeah, well, they just spent $6 billion on a fence across the southwest border. Okay, so uh, $34 billion on cash for clunkers. So it's all relative. But it's a good start, we think. We think it makes sense. We think it makes scientific sense. We think it makes practical sense. Um, and that is how we're spending your money. And I am, again, very honored that you would take a, a lovely afternoon and spend it with me. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions that I can. This guy's teacher is. Give him an A. That is a damn good question. And that's the thing that people don't get. First of all, there's a difference. This slide shows there's a difference between substance use and harmful use and addiction. Okay. Substance use is basically a function of availability and access. It's like every other commodity you have. If, if there are candy bars here, I'm more likely to eat a candy bar than if they're in the back of the room. In the grocery store, if your product is at eye level, you will sell 25% more than if that same product is at waist level. And so too, if you make any commodity, but particularly drugs, more available, more easily accessible, more people will use it. So this will be a very, that shift will start to shift up. Okay. Now, addiction, and it don't make no difference which drug, it, it makes some difference which drug you're talking about, but the disease of addiction 
is not merely a function of use. And to some extent, we don't know what causes addiction, but we do know that it's associated with genetic expression. The, from twin studies, we know that the genes associated with cocaine, and particularly alcohol and opiate abuse, make some people much more vulnerable to the disease of addiction, okay? And so, round numbers, 10% of all the people who use anything are going to end up in the, at the top of that triangle. And now, if addiction were merely, the, if it were the only thing you had to worry about, and you said, well, it's 10%, you know, maybe it's worth it. Let's just go ahead, make it, it you know, with all this uh, crime that's been associated with, well, we, you know, maybe it'll be worth it. But it's not just that, and it's what you said. You gotta worry about the middle of that pyramid, because it's not just, not, not, you know from being in school, you know right now kids that are at risk for becoming alcoholic. You can spot them. I know you can. But there are lots of kids that, because, drink too much, or drink once too often, and fall out a window, or drive drunk, or get, say something ugly to somebody and they smack them and break their jaw. All kinds of these things. That happens no matter what. And now before somebody asks, but wait, if you legalize it, then you'll reduce the crime and you'll be able to tax. Right, that's, that's quite true. Well, it's quite true you'll be able to tax. Let's take a substance, for example, that is just everybody's, uh, that, that, that is actually the epitome of that. Let's take prescription opiates. Prescription opiates are legal. They have a legitimate medical purpose they uh, are under good control because you have to get a doctor's prescription. And, and we get a tax on it. It's, uh, opiates are the major drug prescribed today. The major drug. Well, there's an immense crime. Uh, dr uh, Canadian, uh, Asian, and Mexican drug cartels are trafficking in opiates and other synthetic uh, Vicodin, Oxycontin, and other synthetic opiates hasn't reduced the crime at all. And the taxes that we pay on drugs that are legal, like cigarettes and tobacco, cigarettes and tobacco are the most taxed substance. They don't come close to paying for the damage that they do to health, to society, to the public. So if you're wondering where we stand, you don't have to wonder. Bad idea. Think of it this way. We got two wars, we got record unemployment, um, kids are dropping out of school early. Uh, oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's legalize marijuana. That ought to do it. We think it's a bad idea. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thing that was up there and yeah. I'm only used to the things that are already not working. Right. Um, uh, in case you didn't hear in the back, just uh, get me to see if I get this right. Can you help me with any, what if I spent my money on prevention? What am I likely to to see? Right. Probably close. All right. Um, the truth is, it's not. It's hard to tell from actual. Uh, implemented uh, like states that have done it because it hasn't been done. But there are very good uh, models of this thing I was I put up the uh, prevention prepared communities. For example, communities that care is one version of uh, a prevention prepared community. It was developed by the people out in Seattle. And a recent study uh, in schools and communities in Pennsylvania, for example, they did uh, 64 communities in Pennsylvania, um, the, and a randomized control trial. They saw reductions by the uh, by the 10th grade. They implemented it in around the sixth or seventh grade, and by the 10th grade, they had reductions in delinquency, school dropout utilization of emergency room and, and use, tobacco and alcohol use, they didn't, was it, they didn't have enough drug use yet to, to measure, of 
I don't remember the exact numbers, but 15 to 30 percent difference between communities that, that wanted, got organized and everything, but didn't implement uh, the, the communities that care versus those that did. So we think that's going in the right direction. And those are all costly things. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. How would you integrate it? Would it just fall in the primary care physician? That's a good question too. That's uh, that's a that's probably an A too. Um, I showed you here a um, what we're doing with your money in the drug control strategy. Well, four weeks ago, I guess it was three, four weeks ago, something else happened. It was called healthcare reform. Uh, we're talking about 150 million. Healthcare reform is one trillion dollars. And in healthcare reform, um, the substance use services are somewhere between 20, it's still hard to tell, but 20 to 30 percent of that trillion, or 200 to 300 billion dollars uh, over 10 years, 20 to 30 billion a year. Now, Substance use disorders will be an essential part of healthcare reform. Meaning that you can't have a healthcare system without it. Let's take the University of Pennsylvania, that's where I was before I, I uh, went to uh, DC. University of Pennsylvania gets about $40 million a year in research grants for, from alcohol and drug abuse, but they don't have any courses in substance use. Uh, in their medical school or nursing school or psychology school. They don't have a treatment program and they don't want one, okay? It's almost as though they don't mind taking the money from the research, but they'll be damned if they're going to apply anything. Well, they will not be eligible to treat patients by 2015 if they don't have in their health system substance use services. And by the way, I don't just mean the pinnacle here. I mean everything from prevention through intervention to, um, to actual treatment. Uh, further, uh, they get about roughly $30 million, Pencil, Penn does, gets about $30 million in school grants to kids who want to attend nursing or uh, physician school. Um, they won't be able to get those grants. You, the kid can get the grant but he can't use it at Penn unless Penn has a complete curriculum in substance use services. So it is going to change things in a very, very substantial way. Further, um, now in the specialty care substance abuse field, and by the way, I happen to know this is true in, in Maryland, the specialty care field, about a third of the specialty care field can bill for Medicaid. Well, this is all coming through Medicaid, all of it. So if you can't bill for Medicaid, you're out of the game. Um, and again, as it is an essential service, there's no more haggling back and forth between the state and the feds. This is 100% covered, just exactly the same as a care for a broken leg. Now, that's the length, width, and breadth of my knowledge. Those are, that's the legislation how that gets translated, exactly which prevention services are going to be covered, for how much, as administered by whom, with what degree, for how long, little tiny things like that, all to be negotiated. But I will say, and I'm quite sure about this, there is no illness that is going to be more transformed by this uh, major piece of legislation than the uh, substance abuse field. So notice how I have not answered your question. I've told you a great deal about what's planned, but the truth of the matter is nobody knows how this is going to roll out. I, and I, I want to see it. I want to see the docs of the future. I mean, if you ask my, my view, um, you're not going to see, I don't think you're going to see a hell of a lot of docs at University of Maryland uh, primary care treat these guys. I don't. Um, they don't treat... Um, stroke cases either. They send specialty care for stroke, right? They don't treat specialty care 
for chronic schizophrenics even. But for every other ailment, doc, primary care docs, primary care nurses learn how to manage symptoms at a lower level. And I think that will happen. I think the day is going to come when you're going to see docs writing prescriptions for medications like mal naltrexone to stabilize alcohol use in a brittle diabetic, for example. You don't see that today. Another, another key part is the electronic health record. We are not in the electronic health record. If you are a doc and you, you are interested in knowing what uh, Carlo's alcohol use is, you can't record it. Bad. So we're going to try to fix that. Sorry for the long and not very informative answer. Yes, sir. You focused um, pretty much exclusively on adolescents as the period of risk. Right. What, what about <clears throat> research on later onset risk patterns, particularly with alcohol, sort of stress-related patterns, the fact that women's alcohol addiction tends to be post-adolescent onset? Yeah. You know what? The truth of the matter is um, there are a couple of populations where you see late onset um, abuse. One of them is college-aged women and cigarettes. And the other population are people in the service. Uh, but mostly you don't. It is expected that people my age are going to start exhibiting serious substance use problems as they reach retirement. We are the first generation that's had extensive drug use in their past. We have dispensable income. We're going to have time. I'm going to have time on my hands, I can tell you that. And um, so we, we, we are at risk. But I, it's not known what proportion. But the truth of the matter is, any of that stuff dwarf, is dwarfed by the adolescent onset period. You're right to say, don't forget other populations, and particularly people who've begun to exhibit really serious symptoms after some period of latency. They may have acquired it in adolescence, but it was only after they got laid off, for example, from work. That, yeah, that's all true. But um, it, it, this, the service population bears special note. The, they just came out with the statistics for people in uh, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. 26% report, self-report abusing. This is the word. They, they said yes to, I was abusing prescription opiates. So that is more than it was in Vietnam. So we are, I'm expecting problems there. And uh, we will see. Yep, in the back. Nice and loud, please. What have you learned, positive and negative, about working in the real world of policy? Um, I like business. I like business because the business of business is self-interest. It is, I want, there's a, there's a pie here, and I want most of it. Now, you, I can't, probably can't get it, but if I argue back and if I got a product and I can show that, I, I'm going to get as much of it as I can, and everybody knows it. The thing I don't like about politics is the deception. No, we're really interested in the public's well-being. Baloney. Baloney. They're interested in the jobs program, 342 jobs to be exact, their jobs. And, and I say that because it makes it very, very difficult to negotiate, and maybe you've noticed if you read the papers, very difficult to negotiate issues in good faith. They have to be in somebody's interest, and it's not as, as clear what that interest is. So that's point one. Point two, I don't like the pace. It's very, very slow. Lots of meetings, lots of public commentary. And in some sense, that's probably good. That, you know, if we implemented 20 of my great ideas, I guarantee you 15 of them would be bad ideas and you'd have spent your money. Well, the public commentary, at least theoretically, has a way of shaking out the, the, the chaff from the wheat. So I suppose that's, that's positive. On the good side, I expected when I went to ONDCP, in fact, I was told, that the place is full of knuckle-dragging, lazy government bureaucrats. They ought to be just wiped out. And it's wrong. The people that I work with at ONDCP work way harder than any group of people I worked with 
at the University of Pennsylvania or TRI or anywhere else. They work very long hours. Um, what keeps them going is the possibility that through all this morass will come significant change. We think, a little small commercial here, we think this strategy is a change. We think it's a different direction. It seems to be well received by um, uh, South America, Europe, lots of places, and, and it never has been before. We have really not been welcome in most of the uh, places. Uh, so there's that. Um, that's probably enough to get me in trouble. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. How do you justify the continued prohibition of psychotropic drugs, even in research settings, when so little is known about the possible applications for treatment and the potential for abuse of the You know what? I'm sorry. I, I missed some of that. How would you justify the continued prohibition of psychotropic drugs, even in research settings, when so little is known about their application for treatment and their potential for abuse? So, so the, you're, you're asserting that you're not allowed to give psychotropic, what, what do you mean by psychotropic, I assume you mean drugs of abuse, yeah? Well, that's in contention, can psychotropic drugs be abused? Yeah, okay. well, we used to give them all the time. We gave cocaine, opiates, alcohol, under, in controlled settings for, under laboratory settings. Uh, now, you got a good argument on marijuana. The government has been completely, I would say, um, um, they've dissembled on marijuana. They say, we encourage research on the medical ingredients in marijuana, but by the way, you can't have any. Um, we're not going to give you any to study. I think you got a good argument there. Um, and that's changed somewhat, and it's changing. Um, that's about the best. The, the rest, I don't think you have an argument. I don't think there are other psychotropic drugs that you can't study. What about LSD? Loads of studies of LSD. You, now, if you say to me, I want to, I think it would be cool to give kids LSD and see what it does, you're not getting it, okay? But if you say, no, there's a specific research uh, hypothesis and it has a likelihood that it could do this and I do know what the results, the, the risks are and blah, blah, blah. You, yeah, you can. But isn't there a significant discrepancy between the amount of licenses actually granted by the DEA for that research? DEA has nothing to do with that. DEA um, it, it has nothing to do with making drugs available. That's NIDA and HHA, Health and Human Services. And again, I think you got a point with marijuana. The rest of them, I don't think so. I think given a decent, uh, now, <laughs> if you've tried to get a research grant, you know it's not exactly like, uh, say, as long as you're up, get me a grant. You know, it's not easy to, it's not easy to do. But uh, if you have, there's nothing de facto that will prevent you from, st with the possible exception of marijuana, virtually any drug, to include opiates. Enough? I'm afraid we will have Good. to bring this to a close, but Thank there you. will be time for informal comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Sure.